So if you would, open up your Bibles right now to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, and we're going to begin this seventh chapter of the Gospel of John as we spend some time with it here. So let's pray as we prepare our hearts for God's word. Father in heaven, we pray right here, right now, that you would do the work that's necessary in our heart and in our mind to receive your word. We understand, Lord, that what we need from you this morning when it comes to your word, it's not just a matter of academics or education, but Lord, there's a spiritual dynamic here. And so we need you to do a work in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Do it now in our midst, we pray. We pray that Jesus would be exalted. Do this, Lord, in our midst, in Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 7, beginning now at verses 1 and 2, we read, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. So Jesus was being very careful about his time in Judea and Jerusalem. That's in the southern part of the geography of Israel. Galilee lies more in the north. Jesus being very careful about this because he was a wanted man. The religious leaders who John, the author of the Gospel of John, often calls the Jews, when he says the Jews most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time in the Gospel of John, when he uses that phrase, the Jews, he doesn't mean the Jewish people as a whole. What he means is the religious leaders, the religious establishment, they sought to kill him. And so Jesus, understanding something of the Father's perfect timing, understood when his death was supposed to come. It wasn't going to come too late, but not a moment too early. And he understood, I need to stay out of Judea and Jerusalem until the appointed time. <laughs> then we're also heard, heard here in verse 2 that it was right around the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles is one of the three major feasts on the Jewish calendar. There was also Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles took place somewhere, according to our calendar, in September or October. It was a fall time, a harvest time sort of festival. And one of the things that it commemorated was how God took care of Israel when they came out of Egypt and on their way to the promised land. You know, when they came out of Egypt and spent those 40 years in the wilderness on the way to the promised land, they didn't live in houses. You don't live in the house when you're traveling through the desert. They lived in tents. They lived in temporary shelters. And as sort of a commemoration of that, the families of Israel, and some do this to this day, when the Feast of Tabernacle comes around, they would build themselves shelters, maybe make a little frame, put some palm branches over it, and they would sort of camp out. Maybe on the rooftop, maybe in the backyard, maybe someplace close. But they would do it together as a family to remember their wilderness wanderings together. More importantly, God's faithfulness to them during the wilderness wanderings. And they would celebrate it together during the Feast of Tabernacles. That's when these events took place. Now verse 3. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. First of all, look back to verse 3. That's a verse that may surprise some of you. Where it simply says, his brothers therefore said to him. Some people are very surprised to read that Jesus had brothers. I'll blow your mind even more. In the Gospel of Matthew, it says that he had sisters. You see, after Mary was miraculously used of God to conceive the Messiah with no earthly father, but only an earthly mother, Mary, and that which was conceived in her, the child Jesus Christ, was conceived miraculously by the power of the Holy Spirit. After Joseph and Mary came together in marriage, after the birth of Jesus... They had normal marital relations, and they had children. Jesus had, now if we want to be technical here, what would we call them? We would call them half-brothers. 
and half-sisters. Why do we call them half? Because even though they, same, they shared the same biological mother, they did not share the same biological father. Because Jesus' biological father, so to speak, was a miracle of the Holy Spirit, and it certainly was not Joseph. And so we're told of this, very simply, that Jesus had brothers and Jesus had sisters. And I just want you to think about that for a moment, because we don't think about it very often, do we? What would it have been like for Jesus to grow up in that home with brothers and sisters all around him? You guys know a little bit of the family dynamics in your own home, either growing up or as it is right now. You know sometimes the strife and the contention that there can be between brothers and sisters in a family? You know sometimes how there can be sibling rivalries or jealousies or difficulties? How would you like it if Jesus was the oldest brother in your home? How, how hard would that be? How long could Mary and Joseph resist saying, why don't you just do it like Jesus does it? <laughs> you know, Jesus never, he always makes his bed. Why can't you make your bed just like Jesus does? <laughs> Jesus was a perfectly obedient son. He never sinned. And look, let's just face it. For one of the brothers or sisters of Jesus, that was a tough family to grow up in. Some of us live in the shadow, you know, of an older sibling who excels in some way. That's nothing compared to having an older sibling who is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so it doesn't surprise us when we read that there was some difficulty in the relationship between Jesus and his siblings. And this is what it's centered around in the text of John chapter 7. Look at verse 3. It says this. His brother said, Go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing... Now into verse 4 it says, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. Basically, the brothers of Jesus said it like this. Jesus, you say you're the Messiah. You say you're God the Son. Then why don't you go prove it on the big platform? Go prove it in Jerusalem. You see, there was a big difference between Galilee and Jerusalem in sort of the culture and the environment. Galilee was thought to be sort of, you know, the, the, the hillbilly area, the backwoods area. They weren't so sophisticated. They weren't so spiritual. They weren't so smart. The real energy, the real sophistication, that was in Jerusalem. And the brothers of Jesus say, you know, Jesus, you do a lot of miracles here in Galilee. You do a lot of teaching here in Galilee. But, you know, if you really want to impress the crowds, if you really want to show your Messiah membership card, you better throw it down there in Jerusalem. That's where everybody's going to be impressed by it. Take your show on the road and impress them there. Now, friends, you've got to understand that it was widely believed in those days that when the Messiah appeared, he would blow everybody's mind by spectacular demonstrations of power. He would make himself known in some public and spectacular way. And this is what the brothers were challenging Jesus to they challenge Jesus, their half-brother, you go out and prove yourself. I like the way that the Living Bible expressed it. It translated this verse like this. It says, you can't be famous when you hide like this. If you're so great, prove it to the world. You see, their assumption was that what Jesus really was about was fame and notoriety. Friends, don't you understand that they did not comprehend the mission of Jesus. In their minds, and please remember, these were the very half-brothers of Jesus who thought this way. In their minds, the main mission or ministry of Jesus was to become famous, to become popular, to become powerful. It might sound so obvious that it seems strange for me to say it, but can I just remind us that that was not Jesus' goal in his life. His goal was not to become famous. His goal was not to become popular. His goal was not to become powerful. Friends, if that was the goal of Jesus Christ in his life, he could have just stayed up in heaven. Can you imagine what it was like for Jesus in heaven? Every time, every moment of every uh, existence there in heaven, there were spectacular angelic beings praising him all the time. If he wanted acclaim, if he wanted popularity, if he wanted attention, if he wanted the demonstration of his power, friends, why don't you just stay up in heaven? That's where you have all of that. He didn't need any of that when he existed in heaven. No, he came down to earth because he was looking for something else. But you can also say this, that they also did not understand the glory of Jesus. 
they thought that the glory of Jesus was demonstrated mainly, or perhaps even only, in miraculous works. But Jesus was going to display his glory in a different way. Friends, you know, when Jesus walked on the water, don't you think that was pretty glorious? When Jesus calmed the storm, that's glorious. When he uh, uh, fed 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes, that's pretty glorious, don't you think? Every leper healed. Every deaf person with their ears open. Every blind man given sight. All of that is glory and power. We go, wow, that's amazing. But friends, none of that compares to the glory of God that was on display when he went to the cross and gave himself as a substitute and a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus' brothers had a very shallow view of what the glory of Jesus was all about. And friends, I hope you understand this. I hope you understand that the most glorious, significant thing that the Son of God ever did was to pay the penalty for sin that you and I deserve. Was to make a way, <clears throat> no, I'm not going to say that. Not to make a way, but to be the way that you and I come back into right relationship with God. And if you're not in right relationship with God today, Jesus stands before you and says, come to me at the cross. If you need strength for your life, if you need to be set right between you and God again, that's the key, come to Jesus in his crucifixion. Friends, if I need to put it to you, the Jesus that healed the blind, <clears throat> even though that's wonderful, that's not the Jesus in his work there that makes you right with God. It's what he did on the cross to die as a sacrifice for our sins. And so that's what he points to again and again. And his brothers, even his own half-brothers, didn't get it. That's why we read this in verse 5, which is a little bit of astonishment. I'll just say it for myself. It astonishes me. Look at verse 5. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Would you just let the weight of that verse sink into your soul for a couple moments? Even his brothers did not believe in him. Friends, that says something very, very powerful. That the brothers of Jesus never seemed to be supportive of his ministry before his death and resurrection. After his resurrection, his brothers, or at least some of them, seemed to be numbered among the disciples. We know that from Acts chapter 1, verse 14. But friends, isn't it amazing that those closest to Jesus looked at him and looked at his life and they go, nah, I don't know if this is for real. Now, by the way, can I tell you something? This shows us the integrity of the Bible accounts. If you were making up the story of a Messiah, let's just say you were making it up, you're creating it. Would you have those closest to him not believing that he was the Messiah? You wouldn't write it that way. If you were playing let's pretend and just creating a story, you wouldn't make his own brothers disbelieving in him. No, you would make it the other way around, that they would believe in him the most. But it also shows us something else of how difficult the life and the work of Jesus was. Friends, there's so many of us. I count myself as one of them. Who am very blessed by the peace and the support and the goodness of my home life. I, I, I can't tell you how much my marriage and the relationship with my children means to me as a refuge. A, a, as a place to come back and say, you know, even when I feel like other things in the world are against me, I come home and I know that my wife loves me. I know that my wife respects me. I know that there's something good and solid foundational right there in the home. And it's such a refuge for me. You know how it is. I, I hope you know how it is, men. How you can feel like you're just beaten down by the world, but you come home and you're refreshed. You come home and there's blessing and goodness there for you. And listen, friends, if your family life is not like that, I, I just ask you to pray the simple prayer that God would make it so. Because I think that's one of the chief blessings that God gives unto man. But can I tell you, if your family life is not like that, if you come home and, and you don't find support and you don't find help, especially in your own walk with God, can I tell you something? That you have a sympathetic heart in the Son of God. Because Jesus didn't have that support. Jesus, among his own brothers, they rejected him. Those who should have trusted in him, those who should have respected him, they did not. They rejected him instead of respecting him. And it just brings to mind one other thing that I'll just mention without going into great depth. But isn't it true 
that sometimes the, mer- the very most difficult place for us to live out our Christian life is within our own home. Friends, that's why the Bible says that the real test of our Christian life and our Christian character is our life as husbands and wives, as fathers and mothers, as people within the community. Friends, um, it needs to be real with me and my life in my home. It's one thing for a man to get on a platform and assume some kind of spiritual authority, but the character needs to be demonstrated in the home, week in and week out, in a way that really glorifies God. But that can be the toughest place to live a godly life, can it not? And that is very, again, the situation here with Jesus and his brothers. So look at Jesus' reply, beginning now at verse 6, where he says simply this. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to the feast, for my time has not yet fully come. And when he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. Jesus said this, you know, brothers, you guys are so insensitive to the will and the timing of God Any time is good for you, but not for me. For me, I must wait upon the will and the timing of my Father in heaven. For Jesus, the timing of his God and Father was important. And because his brothers were not submitted to God's will in the same way, any time was good for them. You see, as Jesus obeyed his Father, he lived out this important truth that God's timing is an important expression of his will. Can I say that again? God's timing is an important expression of his will. And there are many things that in our life, as we experience them with God, that we will be challenged on whether or not we will wait for God's timing. You know, sometimes this challenge comes to people uh, in, in their life where they'll have some opportunity, but the opportunity is not of God. Will they wait for God's timing? Or will they run ahead of God? And friends, it's so important for you and I to understand that there is a will of God and there is a timing of God. God may have a wonderful, precious gift for you. He, he may have a spouse for you. He may have children for you. He may have a career for you. He may have some sort of gift, some kind of enabling for you. He may have a ministry for you. And it's not just that God has those things for you, but he has those things for you in his timing. Are you willing to wait upon the timing of the Lord? You see, for those who aren't submitted to God's will, the time is always now. Now is good. Now is the right time for whatever it is that God would have for me. And God says, no, I just don't have a will for you. I have a timing in which it needs to work out. But friends, again, for those who do not rely on God's timing, their time is always ready. And they just try to figure it out on its own. I don't have any doubt. There's people right here listening to me this morning. And you're really sort of frustrated with God because his timing doesn't seem to be right in your life. There's something right now, and I don't know what it is. It's a relationship, it's a career thing, it's a life thing, it's a health thing, but for you right now, it's now, God, why not now? And for whatever reason, God says, no, now is not the time. I will wait. Well, will you wait for him? Will you wait upon him? Jesus understood this. And so he said, I'm not going to go up with the great procession of pilgrims who are going from Galilee to Jerusalem. I'm going to stay here until the appointed time. You see, Jesus had a different kind of heart than his brothers. It's explained right there in verse 7 where he says, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You see, the brothers of Jesus agreed with the common opinions of their day. They thought the same way everybody else thought, and that's why they didn't go against the current at all. They just flowed with the current. But friends, a dead fish can flow along with the current. It takes life and ability to swim against the flow and the current of the world. And that's what Jesus said that he did. And so, verse 8, he says, No, I am not yet going up to the feast. But then he would decide to go in a different way. Look, verse 10. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, 
but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now this really sets us up for where we're going to get into next week when Jesus is going to have these wonderful discussions and even confrontations with the Jewish leaders as he arrives there in Jerusalem. But the first thing we find out here in verse 10 is that Jesus did go to Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, but he went his way in his time. He wasn't going to go up with everybody else in the big crowd full of publicity and full of attention. No, it was sort of a secret departure for Jerusalem, a secret arrival to the city. And when Jesus came to the city, look at what verse 12 says. It says, there was much complaining among the people concerning him. They complained. Well, why isn't Jesus here? Why isn't he doing those public miracles? Why isn't he displaying himself as the Messiah? Where's Jesus? We wanted a show. We wanted some action. Where is it all? And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to do that. And people complained because of it. But now look at verse 13. Look at the analysis that people had of him. It says there in verse 13, some said he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. Friends, isn't it interesting that Jesus divided people when Jesus was right there in the midst of some people thought one thing about him other people thought another thing about him people were divided in their opinions about Jesus Christ and friends the same is true today people who hear about Jesus and understand something about him they make up their mind one way or another about him they cannot remain neutral they have to decide one way is he good or is he a deceiver and if you notice right here in our text, there were several different opinions about who Jesus was. Verse 13 tells us that some people thought he was a good man. Does everybody see that? Some people thought Jesus was a good man. Other people thought that Jesus was a deceiver of the people. Do you see that as well? And if I could ask you, you take, just let your eyes go down in your Bible down to verse 20. Down to verse 20 of um, John chapter 7. We read that other people said this. Then the people answered and said, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Other people thought that Jesus was crazy, that he had a demon within him. So friends, which is it? Was Jesus good? Was Jesus a deceiver? Was Jesus mad? Was he beside himself, perhaps even filled with a demon? I want you to think of those three options. Good, a deceiver, or crazy, you, you know what I think is the worst option among those three? The worst option among those three is not to say that Jesus was crazy. The worst option among those three is not to say that Jesus was a deceiver. The worst option among those three is to say that Jesus was a good man. How could I ever say that? Well, friends, because Jesus could never be just a good man. Let me explain to you why. Because Jesus said amazing, even preposterous things about himself. When you consider the kind of things that Jesus said about himself, you have to decide one way or the other about him. He can't just be a good man. I'll just give you a little tour through the Gospel of John. Just in the Gospel of John, just up until chapter 7, these are some of the things that Jesus said about himself. Ready? He said that he would raise himself from the dead. He said that he came from heaven. He said that if you believe on him, you would have eternal life. He said that he gives living water. He said that he's the Messiah. He said that he perfectly obeyed God. He said that he would judge the whole world. He said that everybody should honor him just as they honor God the Father in heaven. He said that he would raise the dead. He said that the Hebrew scriptures actually speak of him and point towards him. And he said that believing on him was the most important work that a person could do to please God. Now, I just want you to take it seriously. That a man walked among other men and said such things about himself. 
And when you understand these claims that Jesus made about himself, you got a choice. Either he was right about those claims or he was wrong about those claims. Now, friends, if Jesus was right about those things that he said about himself, then he's God. And he deserves our worship. He deserves our surrender. He deserves everything we have in our life. If God actually became man and walked on this earth and told us to believe in him and to follow him and to surrender our lives to him, what more important thing is there in this world other than to do exactly that? If he was correct about himself, then he deserves our worship and our surrender. But friends, if he was wrong, if Jesus was not truly whom he said he was, then there's only two options. Either he knew that he was wrong about himself. That makes him a liar. I know that I am not God the Son, but I'm going to tell everybody I am. That makes me a liar. Friends, can a liar be a good man? No. Now, it's also possible, at least theoretically, that Jesus was wrong about these things, but didn't know he was wrong. What would that make him? It would make him crazy. Friends, cuckoo. But put him in the padded room. Because he just doesn't think like he's Abraham Lincoln or Napoleon or something. He thinks he's God. He thinks that at the end of the age, he will judge every living soul. If you're wrong about that and don't know you're wrong about it, you're out there. So do you see that we really only have these options when it comes to who Jesus is? As a young believer, I had it explained to me like this. Jesus has to be either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. There's no three other options. And friends, isn't this amazing? How Jesus stands before humanity today, still as the central figure, the one who has made a greater impact upon human uh, history more than any other individual, and he still stands before men and women. He still stands before you today. He says, once you make up your mind about me and who I am, either accept me or reject me. Either recognize that what I said about myself is true and honor me as God or Lord, or Reject me as crazy or a liar. He's either liar, lunatic, or Lord. There was a great uh, Christian writer from a previous generation named C.S. Lewis. Many people know him through his works of fiction, Chronicles of Narnia, and all that kind of thing. But but he also wrote some really um, really good uh, apologetic and uh, explanatory works about the Christian faith. And one of those books is called Mere Christianity. It's a book that's had a big impact on my Christian life. And in his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said this. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman and something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and call him a demon. You can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. So when you see in verse 13 of John chapter 7 that some people said, he's a good man. Those were the people who were most wrong at all, of all. Because either he's God or he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. Now, one other thing to look at in verse 13, and just turn your eyes there, and we'll close with this. It says, however, no one spoke openly of him for fear. You see, the religious leaders did not want people to talk about Jesus at all. Some people had this opinion. Other people had this opinion. But you know what the strategy of the religious leaders was? The strategy of the religious leaders was to put kind of a, 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 of a, of a, of a squashing upon all discussion of Jesus. I don't want people to think about him or talk about him at all. And friends, I see in this an illustration of a satanic strategy in this world. Because more than anything, more than anything, the devil does not want you to think about Jesus. He'd rather you think about a thousand other things. He'd rather you think about religion. 
He'd rather you think about church services. He'd rather you think about entertainment. He'd rather you think about celebrities. He'd rather you think about all the other things you'd rather do. He'd rather think about the brunch that you'd like to go to right now. On and on and on and on. But friends, if there's anything he could stop you, he does not want you to think about Jesus. Just like these religious leaders did not want people to think about Jesus. Can I encourage you to give the greatest thumping to the devil that you could give to him today? And just determine in your heart and in your mind that you will think about Jesus. Friends, this is the point of it, isn't it? Is this not the point to being a Christian? Is having a real relationship with Jesus Christ? That's it. That's the point. And if the devil can do anything, if he can't stop you from being a Christian, then as much as he can, he wants to separate you from a vital abiding in Jesus Christ. He wants you to not speak about Jesus, to not think about Jesus. And I just want you to determine you're going to counteract them. You are going to talk about Jesus. You are going to think about Jesus. He's going to dominate your thoughts. He's going to dominate your desires. He's going to dominate that special place in your heart that belongs for the worship of the only true God and the greatest thing of your attention. Friends, the worst is to be influenced to not think about Jesus at all. In fact, if you were to go up and down State Street and interview people there today and you're just talking to people, well, what, what, what about Jesus? What, what, you know, people would have this opinion, I think he's this, I think he's that, but honestly, wouldn't most people say, I haven't thought about Jesus all week. And that's why pretty much it's a win whenever people think about Jesus. I would rather that you think about Jesus and be angry at him and oppose him because at least then you're thinking about him and he'll find a way to sneak in the back way. You, you just think about Jesus and he'll find a way to win in your life. The biggest thing we have to do with a battle with in this world is indifference. You know, there's a rise today in what they kind of call the new atheism. People coming up with new and strong arguments. No, you shouldn't believe Billy Lever. No, you should reject Jesus Christ. I kind of say, bring it on. If we talk about these things, if we get people to think about who Jesus is, we win. The greatest work is done by playing that soft violin in the background and putting us to sleep to where we never think about Jesus at all. So friends, what is it going to be for you? Now, I feel like it would be almost irresponsible for me to end this message without giving an invitation for people to give their life to Jesus Christ. Maybe for the first time this morning, you've seen it with a clarity that you've never seen it before. Well, okay, either he is a liar, I don't think he's a liar. Uh, maybe he's a lunatic. No, he can't be a lunatic. He must be Lord and God. And you realize that if he is Lord and God, you are duty bound as a creature of his to surrender your life to him and to come in repentance in light of the cross of Jesus Christ and what he did for you as a substitutionary sacrifice. Well, this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to pray in just a moment. And then after that prayer, we're going to have our prayer team come forward. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward right now. And, and I mean that right now, not a metaphorical right now, but I mean a right now, right now. <laughs> Thank you, HUD. And uh, after I pray, I'm going to invite anybody who wants to give their life to Jesus, you just walk forward and pray with somebody here on this prayer team. And, and I know it takes some courage to do that. I, I'm not denying that at all. But look, let's face it. This is the friendliest audience that you'll ever follow Jesus before. If you can't make a stand for saying, I want to be a follower of Jesus in this room where everybody loves you and supports you, you'll never be able to follow Jesus outside in a world that's hostile to him. So I'm going to pray and then give this simple invitation. Father, I pray now that if there's any here this morning who, Lord, maybe they've heard it dozens of times before, but for whatever reason, Right here, right now, they've heard it in a way that makes sense to them, in a way it's never made sense before. Lord, I know it makes sense today, not because of the words I've spoken, but because of the witness of the Holy Spirit to their heart. And so, Lord, I pray that if there's any among us here this morning that you are calling right here, right now, to come and to entrust their life to Jesus Christ, that you'd give them the determination and the courage 
to rise to their feet and to come and to pray with somebody on this prayer team. Do it, Lord, for your sake, in Jesus' name. Amen.